morning's docket. Case number 107516, State of Kansas v. Swint. May it please the court, I'm Heather Sussman with the Appellate Defender Office here on behalf of Mr. Swint. I would like to request four minutes for rebuttal time, please. Four minutes is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to start off this morning talking about issue number one in the briefs. Um, this, of course, is the uh, evidentiary issue about the statements by the victim in this case, SAB, indicating that she had requested that another person, AH, um, make false accusations of a similar nature against Mr. Swint. Mr. Swint was prevented from presenting that evidence at trial and has appealed that. Uh, by, by stating the issue the way you did, I want to focus on, on the uh, other element that's claimed in the brief about that she admitted to her cousin that she was lying about those allegations. And, sure. and you know, the Court of Appeals took you to task saying that the statements in the brief weren't true. And so the well, way you worded that, are you conceding that the that this uh, prior inconsistent statement was not raised prior to trial? Well, Your Honor, I think that the it was not explicitly discussed in that manner until after the, uh, until basically the motion for new trial. So at the time that they were having the order and lemonade discussion, um, that was not explicitly brought out by defense counsel. It was not until he was making the proffer at the motion for new trial. So I'll admit that that's the, factually that's how it came out. Um, I think the, the context of the argument in this case is important, and our our argument is essentially that the um, and that the statements in this case um, that are at issue came from a particular um, report that was made by AH to I believe it was um, some authorities in Wichita that was then investigated by SRS. And I think from the context of the conversation that was had during the motion in Lemonade, it was pretty clear that all the parties understood which specific, which allegations were being made. And so I think even though the defense counsel did not explicitly talk about the particular portion of that statement that she said that she lied about the statements against Mr. Swint, that it was clear from the context that they knew what allegations and assuming that the defense attorney was during his proffer, not misstating what the evidence would have been from the statements that AH made, I would argue that this court could potentially find that that was incorporated I don't during see the conversation. I, and I don't, and, and that's where I'm. And a ultimately, little, I mean, really, it was, we got to back up from right. where we're sitting here. Uh, so the first question is whether the district court prohibited the defense from asking a question about the victim admitting that she lied. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that prohibition in the court's order. And it seems pretty specific, don't you agree, I would, to the other statement, not this one. I would agree, Your Honor. I and would if agree. that's true, then I went and looked at the cross-examination of the, of the victim here, and there was never any effort by the defense to ask about or make any kind of record about not being prohibited from asking about her admission of lying. So that being the case, we have to approach this that it wasn't request, you know, there was no pro, there was no order, and the defense just didn't ask the question. And, and I, would, I would certainly understand why the court would get to that conclusion. And I will admit that that particular statement is much more uphill battle for us on appeal than the other statement, which was clearly discussed. Um, I think that, I guess as far as the defense attorney not asking the question and argument, again, I would fall back on the idea that because they were specifically talking about um, particular allegations that were actually made by AH2, um, and I, I'm not sure if it was clear if it was to a school or to the police or to the SRS, but apparently SRS had come and investigated that this was a known um, statement. It's not like some random, hey, I think she said this, um, that they 
un- all understood what they were talking about here. And so I think the defense attorney is not then asking the question was because he assumed that all of that was off limits because of the way that the pro se motion had uh, gone. We have to look at but, the court order. And the court order is, ex- you, it, and, you, is explicit as to what it's prohibiting. And ultimately, I would agree that the court order did not explicitly prohibit that question. So, and, and as I said, the, um, I think the problem here is that the defense attorney during his proffer, and assuming the defense attorney was not misstating what H was going to testify to. This is the proffer at, at the end. At the, for the motion for new trial. Right. Okay. Um, that when he was trying to make his proffer, that was the first time that that did come out. Okay. Um, and, and so I guess that's our best response to that. Um, however, I do think that the initial or the the second half of that statement, uh, where she had recruited essentially age to make false accusations um, of the similar nature to um, people in authority, like I said, I'm not sure if it's entirely clear who those initial accusations were made to, um, was problematic in this case. <clears throat> um, and the Court of Appeals, in its opinion, came out and said that that was not uh, properly proffered below, and in rereading the Court of Appeals opinion, it seems almost like there's sort of a, a two-prong problem. It, I, um, I think they were partially concerned with the idea that it wasn't sufficient because the proffer was not made until the motion for a new trial, that it wasn't sufficient to preserve the issue for appeal. And then secondly, that there was foundational problems with the proffer to begin with that would have precluded the district court from sufficiently addressing the issue. As far as the district court sufficiently addressing the issue, again, I would fall back on the fact that everyone seemed to be very cognizant of what they were talking about here. And certainly the district court did not give any indication that he had specific questions or concerns about the foundational issues in this case. And he did make a ruling on the merits of, of the uh, admission of that evidence, um, and not based on foundational problems, but on the admiss- legal admissibility itself under the statute. Uh, and so. I, I think that that's not a, a concern that prevents this court from addressing that issue. As far as the timing of the proffer in this case, obviously it would have been nice had the proffer been made earlier, but I think for the purposes of appeal, again, I think it was pr- pretty clear from the context of the conversation that was happening um, that everybody understood which allegations were being discussed. Even the state was, I think, the first one to, to put on the record um, AH's initials or name as the person who was making the statements because obviously they were fully aware of what what allegations were being discussed. And the court, again, never expressed any concern. I think then the fact that the defense attorney, for the purposes of the appeal, was trying to proffer that testimony and was prevented from doing so by the district court, um, I think sort of sets him up for failure if this court then says, that's not good enough. We needed to hear that testimony because the district court said that that was sufficient for the purposes of the appeal. The thing I'm bothered about on, on this statement, the mm-hmm. um, asking the cousin to lie, mm-hmm. is that it, it looks to me like the district court arguments went to state of mind and motivation, and then, and that's what was argued by the defense, and then you get up here on appeal and you're making a barber argument. And so it seems like you're, you've abandoned the issues that were discussed at the district court in favor of new arguments on appeal. Am I wrong about that? Well, Your Honor, I would respectfully disagree with the court. That was what the Court of Appeals partially held as well. And I would disagree with that in the sense that I will, I will say that the defense below did not explicitly talk about the Barber case. However, I think the context of what they were talking about was pretty clear that they were talking about the admissibility of these particular statements for the purposes of credibility to support the defense's ability to sufficiently cross-examine the witness on the factual you know, question that was the whole basis of the defense in this case, which was whether or not these things actually happened, because of course Mr. Swint maintained that they did not. And so I think that was a effort to clarify um, that the um, defense's argument below. And I would support that by pointing to the fact that the defense, although he, the defense attorney, although they could have su- more sufficiently set out exactly what they were trying to go for, it repeatedly said that part of the reason why they were trying to get this evidence in was to show the motivations of SAB um, in making and telling the story that she was telling. And again, I think the telling the stories that she was telling and her motivations for that clearly implicates 
the defense that she was making these things up and they wanted to attack her credibility on that. The, so, the thing that, the other problem I'm having, then I'll shut up, is um, that's what I I'm don't see how you were, um, de the defense was prevented from presenting the defense that this is a credibility fight and she's lying and I, and I, the defendant, am telling the truth. I don't see how you're precluded from, the, from that defense by this evidentiary ruling. I mean, the, the defendant testified, the family of the defendant testified and, and put in dispute facts mm -hmm. re regarding uh, all that, and then uh, the defense had the opportunity to cross-examine the little girl. So how, are you, so how are you prevented from presenting a defense as opposed to just a, a piece of evidence? Well, and I guess I guess that's a um, distinction without a difference to me as a defense attorney is that not being able to fully present your defense, which is, uh, you know, basically evidence that there was making up of allegations in this case when your when your defense is that these allegations were not true. And I just wanted to point out for a second that 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 it's particularly important that that's my client's defense in this case. If his defense was that there was some innocent explanation for the touching, then I think that that there might be a serious question about whether or not this affected his right to present his theory of defense. But because his theory of defense was these things did not happen, and you have evidence from the complaining victim in this case who's recruiting other people to make up the same false allegations against my client, I think that that's fundamentally disturbing to our sense of justice and that he had a right to present that as part of his defense and not being able to do so inhibit his ability to present his full defense. And although this court has, in other cases, I think we talked about Gilliland a little bit in our brief, has uh, drawn a distinction between a complete denial of the defense versus a partial denial of the defense on an evidentiary hearing, I think from a defense perspective, I think that that, again, is a distinction without a difference because not being able to fully present your defense is not being able to present your defense to the jury. And um, and I think that rises to the same level of a constitutional problem as, as not being able to present any defense. So even though he was able to put on other witnesses, I mean, I think he had a couple family members who testified, and even though he himself was able to testify, as you can imagine, I mean, this court's seen many criminal cases, um, you know, the credibility of the defendant is always sort of starting from three steps behind. And particularly in a case like this, where the only evidence to support this crime, the only evidence was her statements. There was no physical evidence. There was no witness or anything like that. It was her word against his. That was a crucial piece of the defense that was not able to be presented at trial that would have made a difference. And Judge McNanny on the Court of Appeals agreed with that and said that he would have reversed. So, I mean, I think that's where the difference between a complete versus a partial denial is that in this particular case, under these particular facts, I think that this was such an important piece of evidence that it does rise to the level of a denial of his right to present his theory of defense. Um, I see I'm out of time, so other than that, if the court has no other questions, I'll submit the rest of the issues on the briefs as we file them. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> May it please the court, David Belling, Assistant Fort County Attorney, appearing on behalf of the state of Kansas. In this matter, the state would request that you uphold the Court of Appeals decision in this matter for all the reasons contained in that decision. Also, there's four issues involved here, and I'm going to concentrate on the first one about the statements by the victim. But as far as the other three issues, if I don't get to those, I'll just rest on our brief previously submitted in the Court of Appeals decision. I think those are the minor issues in this matter. Now, as far as the statements made by the victim, <clears throat> the one statement about that she made up this story, that was never addressed until the post-trial motions. And all it was really was one sentence 
in a two sentence proffer when they'd been ar arguing about whether the statements that she wanted another girl to make these up were being discussed. And, and where, where were those, uh, where were A.H.'s uh, statements? Uh, was there a report, a SRS report or? Um... To the best of my knowledge, and I was one of the trial counsel, I don't think we had any of that stuff. I think we just got it by word of mouth or something. And at what point did the state know that uh, there was uh, allegedly a statement by A.B. that her prior statements were untrue? I, based on my recollection at the post-trial motions, okay. because clearly none of the record supports that this ever came up at the hearing on the motion in limine at either of the hearings prior to trial it was not raised during the course of trial. But you would admit it's pretty compelling evidence if we, you have a he said, she said case and then we have evidence that she, she said, she said, she lied. Um, pretty compelling, isn't it? It could be. I want to direct your attention to the Court of Appeals um, reasoning about the failure of the defense to make a proffer that I frankly wasn't very convinced by that side of it. it. I mean, you put forth the motion in limine, and you said what you wanted excluded, and the discussion was from there, and the court happened to agree with you and entered an order. Um, and so, I mean, do you make the argument that there wasn't a sufficient proffer made by the defense to be able to present that, the propriety of that exclusion? Of, of that evidence to this court? I think that's a weaker argument on this issue. I think the issue <clears throat> that's more compelling is that they raised various objections to this at the trial court level, then abandoned those objections or grounds and raised totally different issues at the appellate level, which based on Case law, if you don't raise the issues you raised at the trial court, those are deemed waived or abandoned. So, that's all I can say on that. Do you disagree with uh, uh, Judge McEnany's uh, uh, contention that the district court understood the substance of the testimony the state sought to exclude through its motion in limine? Do you think the trial judge didn't know uh, what you were trying to exclude, which included the, uh, all the statements from AH? He clearly knew some of it. We didn't know all the details, such as who was present, who, what exactly was said, when this was done. So from that viewpoint... Now, the, the, we, trial, the trial court prevented um, uh, the, that witness from testifying at the new trial uh, uh, hearing. Did defense attempt to put on her testimony at the motion and lemony hearing? No testimony was ever attempted to be presented by the defense at either the pretrial motions or during the trial. And as far as the issue of the court not letting them have AH testify to make the proffer of the evidence, it appears that if the defense didn't like that, they should have made an objection at that point to preserve it, to bring it up to the appellate level. And also, they made just a two-sentence statement, and half of that was about her making up the story, and only one sentence dealt with the, she tried to get somebody else to say he did this to her, too. And <clears throat> the court didn't limit what they could have presented in their oral proffer. I'm assuming that they were going to put on 
the girl and have her testify A, B, C, D, whatever about all the details. But that didn't happen. But that could have been put in their proper proffer. Now, one of the things in this case is the Barber case. The defense has raised that as something that should have been considered. Barber was never mentioned at any time during this trial or during the post-trial motions. It only came up when Mr. Swint filed his brief in this case. And it's the state's position that Barber doesn't even apply in this case because that dealt with prior allegations by a sexual abuse victim against other persons. And actually, I believe one of the allegations involved the person involved in the case, Barber case, but these were from prior to what occurred in that case. And that's not our case here. These were allegations during the course of the several years of abuse suffered by the victim. So I don't think Barber has any relevance or bearing on this case. Plus, it wasn't raised at the trial level, so it shouldn't be considered at the appellate level. Now, <clears throat> it's at the trial, no opinion evidence or evidence of reputation of the victim was presented by the defense. They still had that option. They did not take advantage of that. Now, in the dissent, it talks about Anderson should have allowed the defense to present these new constitutional arguments on appeal. I'd just like to point out that the Anderson case facts are very different than our case. In Anderson, they admitted to the court that this wasn't raised below. Swint didn't do that. They also listed the three exceptions to raising a constitutional issue on appeal when it wasn't considered at the trial court level. They didn't do that in Swint's case. And in, Bar in Anderson, they argued that two of these exceptions applied to this case. Since they didn't raise the issue of exceptions, Swint never made any arguments that any of these applied in his case. So I think that's an important thing to remember. Counsel, I'm, since you've got a pause here, I want to move you over to the prosecutorial misconduct issue. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the prosecution's closing argument that says that uh, today you have the power to say to her, we believe you. Um, it seems like in this day and age, everybody ought to know you can't appeal to sympathy that way. So how do you view that statement to get it within the wide latitude and of what a prosecutor is permitted to do? As far as that's concerned, it's <clears throat> I think the court may have been right on saying that that was improper, but when you go through the second step of the test for prosecutorial misconduct, that it doesn't meet step two. So it should not be found to <clears throat> be misconduct and that it would be harmless error at that point. The basis for arguing that it isn't misconduct by making that statement is that it was a comment on the testimony made by the witness <clears throat> in the case. It was a drawing an inference to the jury that they should believe this witness other than the other witness, or asking the jury to at least think about those issues. Plus, they went on to say, 
a little, just a little bit later, the jury has the power, is the one that makes the decision on conviction. Counsel, you didn't, you didn't, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't petition for review of the Court of Appeals determination that it was outside the wide latitude, did you? No, Judge. So aren't you foreclosed from arguing now that it's, that it wasn't outside the, the wide latitude given prosecutors? In our brief, we argued that it wasn't outside the latitude. Okay, so and you're relying solely on the second part of the, the test, whether or not there was prejudice. In other words, the Court of Appeals found that it was, that it, that it was outside the wide latitude, but it was harmless, right? Yes. Did I answer? Is there anything else you'd like me to address on that issue? Well, you know, I think we have to, ex we're on petition for review up here, and so if you didn't say the Court of Appeals was wrong in its determination of being outside the wide latitude, then you're kind of stuck with that, and now we're into ill will and gross and flagrant, which is why I worded the question the way I did to say in this day and age, don't prosecutors know that we don't point to the victim and say, you know, be sure, you know, give her a boost here by convicting this guy. Uh, yes, I think prosecutors know you don't appeal to sympath sympathy so, for the victim. And so that seems to, to say to me that we've got gross and flagrant, maybe, because everybody knows the rules. So, you know, now we're down to ill will and then whether it's reversible error uh, based on the other things that were said. So that's where I was just trying to get you, was uh, whether there are reasons we should not consider it to be ill will or that it wouldn't be reversible even if we did. Well, <clears throat> as far as the <clears throat> gross and flagrant It was only one statement, and this kind of goes to the ill will argument also. It was only one or two sentences. It was very brief. It was a very limited portion of the closing argument that it didn't specifically say you should feel sympathy for the victim or feel sorry for her. It didn't use direct statements like that. It's less less clear that he was asking for sympathy from the jury for this victim. As <clears throat> the Court of Appeals found there was no ill will out of this based on that, that as I said, right after that statement, court found that he did, the prosecutor did address the jury and go to, they had the power to determine, they were the ones that made the decision on conviction. I'm almost out of time here, so I would just state that as far as the other issues, we rest on our brief previously filed and the Court of Appeals decision. Does anybody else have any questions for me? Any more questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. You reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Starting off just briefly with the prosecutorial misconduct issue, um, I think Justice Deagle, your your uh, statement was right that the the state is precluded from arguing that it was not error on that particular statement because they didn't cross petition. Um, and as far as the harmlessness um, or potential harmlessness of the error, I think again the as counsel admitted, I think it's well known that that's not a statement that's appropriate. Um, it was not repeated over and over again, but it was certainly a theory of their closing to to try and bolster the victim's uh, credibility because that was clearly 
a determination. So telling the jury um, an important determination. And so telling the jury that you can tell her that you believe her, especially in the context of them acquitting on one charge where they clearly did not believe her, I think was um, an improper and, and harmful uh, error. Um, and to the extent that, that counsel argues that the correct statement of law after that um, somehow sort of cures the error, makes it less harmful, I would say that that does not, a correct statement of law after that does not unmuddy the waters that have been muddied by that initial statement. And so to the extent that they were relying on that, and I think in a case where it, credibility is so much a determination, giving them the added boost of, you can tell her that you do believe her on, on whatever charges you're convicting on is, um, is harmful error in this particular fact situation. Um, and at the risk of running back into it again, um, I just had a, another comment on the first issue, which was that the raising the, or allegedly raising a new issue for the first time on appeal on that, obviously it would have been helpful had the defense attorney talked about Barber. Um, and he did not do so. I mean, that's clear from the record. Uh, Clearly, from the conversation that they were having, the judge understood that this was a credibility determination under 6042D. You know, and part of that analysis since 1989 with the Court of Appeals case in Barber has been that part of that credibility determination in a sex case um, potentially involves this other step. And so, to, even though the defense attorney did not assist, probably as much as he had, could have, in making that, I don't think it precludes us from making that argument on appeal because the the district court certainly should have been aware of that case and and understood that that was part of the issue that they were they were discussing. And in our brief, we, um, um, I mean, the basis for Barber was the credibility um, evidence, the right to confront. I mean, that was all very clearly put forth by defense counsel in this case, even though it didn't explicitly discuss Barber. Um, so we would maintain that it is properly before this court, despite the Court of Appeals' opinion. And if it was not, then certainly it was um, an issue of constitutional importance. It can be raised for the first time on appeal, although we did not make that argument at the Court of Appeals, because I think we were <coughs> under the impression that it was an extension of the argument that was already made below. Um, but this court, I think, can still consider it at this level <coughs> on that basis. Um, with that, we would ask that this court uh, vacate the conviction in this case, convictions in this case, and remand for a new trial. Thank you. Any more questions? Would another would another option be to, if we find that the issue was properly preserved to simply send it back to the Court of Appeals to consider the merits? Um, I guess it would depend on on. Well, the short answer to that is yes, <laughs> um, because they did not get to the merits of the issue. And so I, I think it would kind of depend on what the basis for the decision was. If it was the idea that the proffer was sufficient and they needed to consider the merits, that might be a different situation than that the district court, like we argued in our initial brief, didn't make the right findings. That would be more appropriate to remand back to the district court under those circumstances. I Your think. preference, I take it, is for us to not only find that it's properly preserved, but to go ahead and reach the merits here. Right, right, obviously. <laughs> um, but certainly, if going back to the Court of Appeals is the next best option, that's better than nothing, obviously. So, um, but that was a, I hadn't actually thought about that, so thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. We now turn.